my presentation is called Marketing Whiz Wit. Um, it might sound a little funny because I'm not a native Philadelphian, but cheesesteaks are just beautiful. So my presentation actually kind of dovetails really well off of Joanna, so it's more about making sure that your marketing is complete across channels, whether or not you have data, and if it's really hard to find data, what kind of little kind of triggers can you figure out? My Twitter handle is honestly the way I'm most responsive, and frankly, a lot of people get it wrong, so whoever big little a is gets a lot. My handle is big a little a. It's like, get it? Name starts a little a. Or it could be Canadian, big a little a. There we go. Um, I will also say that my presentation is going to be kind of animated and kind of fast, so I try to fit a lot in a short term. So everyone put your notebooks away. I have already taken notes for you, um, which, what are you doing there? There we go. So take a couple of seconds to write this down. This has everything outlined that I hope to touch on. So if I don't touch on it, at least I wrote it down so it's there for you. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to kind of enjoy the presentation a little bit more and follow me as I kind of dance around up here. I'm also going to ask you to bear with me. I'm sure from Larry's overview you heard, a lot of the stuff here is kind of going to be a little bit of a stretch. So I'm first of all, first I'm a guy, um, second I'm a marketing guy, third I'm a digital marketing guy, and probably seventh I'm an analytics guy. So. I may say things that some of the analytics people here don't like, but that is all right. So let's just take a minute and look. It's so nice. But can you describe what makes something as, as beautifully ugly as a cheesesteak like this delicious? Can you quantify what parts of it are worth the $9 that you get? No, but I tried. So, I'm kind of guesstimating that the steak part is worth a third of the deliciousness. The roll is worth 26%, because if you just have steak and roll, it's not bad. The whiz is 19%, and if you get provolone, just leave right now. And <laughs> onions are like 11%, same thing if you're a without person, I don't want to talk to you. And then the quote unquote atmosphere and presentation, there's something to be said for those, especially late at night. But what about if you have one of those pieces individually? So what about if you just have a giant bowl of sautéed onions? Are you getting the 88 odd cents worth of value? Are you getting 11% of the value of cheesesteak? Are you enjoying it that much? The answer is probably not. Um, but the challenge is that we kind of look at our marketing that way a lot. That's, that's kind of where, where attribution modeling looks at. It tries to figure out what in each individual piece is about when really that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The experience goes well beyond just an individual piece. So you just can't, you can't really quantify everything that specifically. So as Larry said, we're going to talk about um, some of my real world examples. So I tend to make some high consideration purchases in the last couple years. I bought a car, which frankly is a pretty boring example. I went to the dealership, drove it, it was good. I bought a bike, which the only reason I mention it is because the donation pandering doesn't stop with the bags. I'm also riding uh, 150 miles with some people here from Sear to fight MS. So if you guys want to donate, that's, that's another good one. And then I swear I'm done asking for money. Um, but probably the highest consideration purchase I've made in, in recent years is a new pair of jeans. So again, I told you to bear with me. This is going to sound a little weird. I am a fan of a thing called raw denim, which basically means you buy pants in their unwashed cardboard state. Wear them for two years. Don't wash them. I stink. Don't even ask. Um, but if you're wearing something for two years, if you're bonding with something that much, it's not going to be like an instant purchase. So I'll kind of take you through the purchase cycle for my latest pair of pants, which I got going on right here. So the first driver, obviously, is old pants are destroyed. Need new pants. That's the first interaction. Go to Google. Um, I'm kind of sick of the brand that I was using before. So go, go, to, go to Google, search for a couple of examples wind up on a discussion forum. So there's a select few people who are extremely passionate about denim and talk about it a lot. This particular site kind of showcases a different brand every couple of days, gives me some ideas. Come to find out there's a guy in Fishtown, about, for those of you not from Philly, like 10 blocks that way, a guy who by himself has a denim brand that hand makes jeans. I thought, oh, all right, that's pretty cool. So I go to Reddit, because Reddit also has a really big community go in and see if I can find any examples of people who have bought jeans from this guy. It turns out, like, all right, he's pretty reputable. So I go back. It turns out when you're a single guy hand-making pairs of pants, you don't really have an e-commerce store. So had to email him, got a little bit, bit of information, didn't really love it, went back to Google, searched again, 
came to kind of the biggest retailer in the space, found a couple of ideas, went back to Reddit to get more reviews, found a pair of pants that were made in Japan, had some cool details like those weird little stripes that apparently have folklore associated with them, took a hard look in the mirror and realized I don't really want stripes on my butt, <laughs> went back to Gmail, finally emailed back and forth a couple of times and wound up buying pants. So that's not really a very linear or even a specific funnel. So as Joanna said, like the funnel doesn't look like a funnel anymore. So I wound up at this really cool store. A guy hand makes me pants, like hooray, excellent. Hand him cash, no credit cards. Again, single guy, no credit cards. So there's no paper trail, there's no attribution, there's no anything. <laughs> but it wasn't really a very linear thing. So here's all the interactions. So if I can try to apply different attribution models to them, every single one of them is gonna look drastically different. So probably the most common attribution modeling that you'll think of is what's called linear. And essentially what that means is that every single touch point gets an equal percentage. So there are kind of 10 interactions, so every interaction gets 10% of the value. The problem with this is pretty obvious that it kind of oversimplifies things and it makes, may give stuff that was in the middle too much credit or too little credit. So that throws away linear. There's a model that's called time decay, which essentially means the one that was farthest away from the end purchase point is worth the least, and it kind of accelerates, so the last touch gets the most value. This doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me because what about the person that made me go look for pants in the first place? And then there's, this has a couple of different names. I call it the U-shape, but it gives the highest value to the first and last touch points. Again, makes no sense because if you cut out something in the middle, you have leaky bucket syndrome. If I don't go to Reddit and get a positive review, I don't have pants. If you have an algorithmic model, which, which the pro is that it's based on a whole ton of data and built by really smart PhDs, the cons are it's built by really smart, really expensive PhDs, and even so, it's still kind of fatally flawed and we'll explore a little bit more. Um, if you go kind of old school last touch, which for some channels may work, but if you go last touch, then that will say that me buying pants was entirely just because of email interactions. If you go by first touch, which probably makes the most sense, it probably goes back to my high school girlfriend who said I look stupid in baggy jeans. <laughs> but again, um, what happens if we cut the least valuable interaction? What if we cut the thing that doesn't have the ROI that we were hoping for, like doesn't have a, a 10 to one? the whole purchase is just not going to happen. So making, making full-blown marketing decisions based on a kind of big picture attribution model just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So the main reason, too, is that attribution modeling, even with the advent of universal analytics and a bunch of other stuff, um, they're really biased. So this is uh, this, the sales page from Clear Sailing, which is one of the bigger attribution providers. Uh, the reason I picked this one is there's a lot of people who have worked with it that I know in the audience, but obviously you can't read this, so I zoomed in a little bit. It calibrates across paid search, comparison shopping engines, display media, email, communications, social media, natural traffic. It provides a complete lens into the customer journey and purchase path across all paid, earned, and owned digital media. Not, not all interactions, just digital media. So only the stuff that it can see on a computer, the only things that are tangible are the stuff that they can track, that go into a database. It doesn't take into account the actual human element and the actual personal element, which to me doesn't make any sense. Until we get kind of like a minority report thing going on where Google reads our brain, which I just found out they filed a patent to like watch your eyes to see when you look at an ad, which is absolutely terrifying. But until that comes true, you're never gonna be able to quantify the offline. You're gonna be able to, to quantify what people are doing or what the ads are driving people to do. There's just too much stuff going on to try and figure out what drives what. But you can kind of find some signals. So what I'm gonna go into is, as Larry said, I run the paid search team here, so I might be a little bit biased, but you can kind of track search behavior based on what sort of ads people see. And you can cross channel track and see what behavior you changed. So Avinash, uh, Google's analytics guy, he, he preaches, well, Google's other analytics guy. <laughs> That's right, he's number two, right? Um, he preaches a lot of things called micro-conversions, so tracking all of the little actions that lead up to a purchase, so submitting your email address, finding directions to a restaurant, all that sort of stuff that leads up to a purchase. My beef with that is that it still falls into that same sort of attribution trap, that you're still looking at what you can track and you're getting rid of the intangibles. 
So instead, as I said, I'm going to go through kind of quant quantifying the impact of media interaction. So let's say you have a wildly successful um, TV campaign. I would venture to guess no one here is working on brands quite like Old Spice. But guess what happens when you launch a really successful television campaign after for a dying brand? The search volume goes up. Surprise, lots more people searching for the brand. So that's great, but our, uh, most small businesses are not going to have that much money or that much of a media push. So what can you do instead? So how many people here go home and just watch TV and do nothing else? There's, no, there's nothing else. How many people here are yoga people? I go home and I do a little bit of yoga. I'm going to see if I can demonstrate my favorite pose. Couch pose, which if you take a look at um, user, come on. If you take a look at user numbers, um, usage for tablets and phones spikes at night. It spikes when people get home. We can't disconnect from one screen, so apparently we need to have two. So we have to tweet while we watch TV. So create paid search ads that kind of focus on what the messaging in your commercial is, so you can kind of complete that customer experience and round it out. You can track performance for that specific hour and see what your TV ad did. You've got to be ready for the bump, though. You've got to make sure that you have your ads ready, that your budgets are big enough, that your experience goes all the way through. And you kind of also have to think, a lot of commercials here are, have you ever seen those commercials where they just kind of put a picture of a Facebook logo on the end of the commercial? It doesn't make any sense, right? But if you do something like Dr. Pepper did, what they did in this commercial is they did hashtag I am a, and then they would send people t-shirts. So people would hashtag it, send t-shirts. It's a much more tangible example. But if not, if, you, if you're just doing a small thing, use a social monitoring tool to figure out if, if hashtag, hashtag usage or interaction with your brand spikes. So I have a picture here of Radian 6 and Gremlin, which are two social monitoring tools. But there's a whole bunch of them. Just make sure to pay attention to that sort of thing, because you know that that spike was driven by something else that you did. So make sure that you're taking credit for it, since you won't be able to get like a full-blown ROI for a TV commercial. This will paint some of the brand lift. PR is one that's, that's kind of an interesting topic. So both of my PR examples are going to relate back to search. So think about a press release. You got a hot new product. Um, it's announcing a brand new product. You're probably not going to have an organic ranking for it yet, because the product's brand new. Your site's probably been live for a couple days tops. So make sure to bid on whatever the new product name is or whatever you're announcing in the press release. And then you'll be able to track what happens. So you wouldn't be able to track something in Google Insights. You won't be able to see spike in search volume. But if you're bidding on the terms, then you'll be able to see exactly what happens. And you got to make sure, again, that, you're, that your ads kind of are synonymous with what's in the product, or what's in the press release, rather, and make sure that the messaging is consistent. What about? Um, kind of public appearances, so getting scheduled things. Does everybody, anybody know who he is? This is Dr. Oz. So my, my favorite Dr. Oz story, or actually probably my only Dr. Oz story, um, we had a client in the past who was in the nutritional supplement space. We found out the day after it aired that one of, our, one of the products was mentioned on Dr. Oz. Guess what happened? So this product went from nowhere that we sold maybe one or two a week to having thousands upon thousands of orders coming in in a day. Thankfully, um, it would have been great to have known this ahead of time, but thankfully we had our budgets blown wide open on paid search. But their inventory wasn't ready. So when people see these media appearances and the kind of impulse purchase based on Dr. Oz's product of the day, they're not going to wait for if the product is back ordered. So having that kind of that that communication between different channels and staffing up and making sure that everything is ready to go, that's a way you can track impact. So if you see that orders go up from 10 a week to 1,000 a week, you know it was Dr. Oz's fault and you know it was your PR team's fault. But if, you don't, if you're not ready for it, then you can't really track anything. Uh, going to kind of more of a digital channel, think about email. Um, so taking a look at this, what do you think happens when Zappos blast out at what I would venture to guess 50 million odd emails featuring Crocs, people are going to search for Crocs. So make sure that the ads are kind of synonymous with what's in the email. Make sure that you have enough products. Make sure that the products that are pictured are readily available. And kind of looking the other way around, what can your search campaigns do for your email campaigns? 
a lot of people are not going to be ready to buy something right away. So I wouldn't be ready to buy a brand new pair of jeans right away, but I would sure sign up for an email list if they were offering 15% off. So what you should be able to do in just about any major email marketing platform is that you should be able to get these people into a special list. So you should be able to dump them and tag them that they came from a paid search source, follow them what they do over time, and make sure that they're driving enough revenue. And then you have to make sure that once you finally send it out, that they have the offer that they're promised. So you can track the success of this based on that list and figure out what your paid search ROI really is instead of just counting how many new email addresses you got. So probably the toughest part would be syncing outdoor ads to online or really outdoor ads to anything. So there's one thing that all three of these have in common, even though they're different brands. Can anybody think of what aside from the fact that they're all outside-ish. In all three cases, people will have these with them. So if you have a very effective outdoor ad, you kind of have to drive people to do something, and then you can kind of track what happens in your mobile site traffic. So drive people to search, obviously not in the way that this used to happen, so you're not going to say AOL keyword, whatever. But you have to make sure that your, ad, your outdoor ads, even though the big thing is to make them shiny and attention grabbing, have some sort of action oriented with them and make sure that your mobile site is up to snuff. Otherwise, people are going to be disappointed and you're going to lose that customer and you're going to waste that money. And then to kind of capture them, since a lot of people will be sort of impulse, give them a super, super, super easy conversion. Make it just giving them a name and an email address on your phone. You can follow up with them with different channels. And again, dump those people into a list or a database and figure out what happens with them long term. Track success, get more money, everyone makes more money, get raises, hooray. The one channel where I think attribution works, and again, tremendously biased as I'm a search guy, but I think it works the most in paid search because paid search is sort of a standalone channel. Um, SEO sort of is too. It's pretty, much pe it's pretty much pull marketing. So people already know what they want. They're asking you for it. You give it to them. It's pretty much it. The challenge is with um, how many people are familiar with AdWords enhanced campaigns that came out a little while ago? Yeah, don't, don't share this with people. Um, so it is what it is, but this, this is kind of Google's foray into, into marketing to the user instead of trying to figure out um, the individual action and search query. So Google knows that people search on different devices. People know that Google knows that people travel. Google has promised, which I would love to know when this is coming, that we will have cross-domain tracking. So if someone searches on a phone and they're signed in and they finish their transaction on a computer, we'll know that. Thursday. Really? No. Oh. <laughs> 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 Every single time I've asked the question, I get the same response of soon. So that really, that threw me off a little bit. But it would be beautiful if we could track all three different things. So someone goes on a computer, finds directions, follows directions on Google Maps, goes to the store, we get a purchase, we can track it the whole way through. Even if that does happen, it's not going to capture the offline, it's not going to capture the brand experience. And Google people, I know you're here and I know there's another one somewhere, just earmuffs for a second. Google's really greedy. Um, they're going to take credit for just about everything because the more credit they take for your ads, the more you're going to advertise and the more stock goes up. So if you compare kind of Google specific metrics to maybe other tracking channels, in my experience, and this is just my experience, they tend to be a little bit inflated. So even though you're going to have all these crazy things like universal analytics that can track people setting foot in a store, take them with a grain of salt because you just never really know what's going to go on. And, and you really have to think about the most important thing in my mind um, for marketing, which is social networking. And I'm not talking like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. I'm talking like what is probably responsible for 99% of my purchases, which is me hanging out with a couple of buddies and one of them tells me about something cool and then I go buy it because I've been at happy hour. And getting kind of brand evangelists is only something that's going to happen when you have a complete marketing portfolio. Everything looks good together and everything works good together. If you cut out individual pieces and get that leaky bucket, it's not going to be good for anybody. So that's all I got. Um, I put my email address up here and, again, the URL with all my notes. I actually don't think I missed anything, so there won't be anything new on there. But Thank you.